Welcome to our webinar about public cloud, understanding the business case and accounting implications. I'm Louise Wayne, I have a background in finance. And I'm Julian Digby, I'm a solutions consultant at Ediserve, uh, generally helping our customers in their uh, migration towards cloud solutions. During this webinar, we aim to give you a better understanding of cloud, accounting for cloud, the total cost of ownership, the value proposition, and changing behaviours to optimise cloud usage models. There's an opportunity to ask questions and we'll have a look at those at the end. So some background. Back in 2013, the government launched a cloud first policy around the adoption of public cloud and software as a service. Cloud adoption within the public sector is still behind the private sector, as there are many concerns. The skills gap is a factor, with a recent study showing that 36% of government workers haven't yet used cloud services. Security is of paramount importance, with many using this as a main concern. However, the latest guidance highlights that security within the public cloud is often superior to other alternatives. This is underpinned with the recent announcement that blue light services can use public cloud. So, the data held by police, ambulance, fire and the Coast Guard can be stored in public cloud. This really supports the journey of travel. And Gartner predicts that by 2020, having a corporate no cloud policy will be as rare as a no internet policy is today. The cloud economics. There were two main drivers. There's a significant drop in capacity hoarding. When you have your own data centre, racks run at 75% capacity to allow for scalability. So this means there's usually a quarter of your capacity wasted. In public cloud, you match your cost with your usage. It's a pay-as-you-go model that scales depending on your demands. Within public cloud, the main players are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud. So the second cost driver is lower unit costs. These major players offer increased scale, newer technologies, best practices and improved operational efficiency. These really are best in class infrastructure, SLAs and resilience. You're transferring the risk so you can focus on the core activities of your organisation. For example, if there is a heat wave, it isn't your responsibility to ensure that the data centre is cooled sufficiently. That's all with the public cloud provider. Let's have a look at an example. So Comic Relief, they use AWS. So we know Comic Relief for the Red Nose Day activities in March, and they have an evening of television dedicated to raising donations for the cause. You'll see in this chart, there's a two hour window during the evening when donations per minute peak. If they were hosting this on their own infrastructure, they would need capacity to be able to deal with this level of calls. In AWS, it isn't a problem, and they simply pay for this doubling demand for the two hour window. So this is a great example of an organization getting the most from the scalability of public cloud and not over-purchasing on-premise kit to allow for peak time capacity. So now we're going to have a look at some of the financial blockers we hear about. Now, some of the terminology I use may be new or not relevant to your sector. However, a general understanding of the key accounting terms is really useful. So you, when you're talking to other stakeholders or other people who work in different industries and sectors, you have a common understanding of the concerns. The CAPEX versus OPEX. The CAPEX is why you buy a fixed asset, something that's going to last you several years and the cost is spread over the useful life of the asset in the form of depreciation. So this comes from the accounting principle of matching. So you're spreading the cost over the period of benefit. So on premise, this is things like hardware, storage, networking, software licensing, implementation, and the cost is spread over the life of the asset. So for example, if you buy a server and you have a depreciation policy of five years for servers, you'll see a fifth of that cost over the next five years feature in your costs as depreciation. In public cloud, there's a shift from CapEx to OpEx. So OpEx, operating expenditure, this is the ongoing cost of running your business. 
and it impacts the expenditure in the current financial year. On premise, this is annual support and maintenance, power, cooling, facilities, staff costs. In public cloud, this is everything. The infrastructure, the cloud services, software licensing, staff costs. Now, you've probably heard there's a real appeal for people to spend CapEx. It's often easier to spend CapEx in an organization than OpEx. Why is this? What is the appeal of CapEx? Well, owning assets makes your company more valuable. It can be used as collateral for financing and assets can be sold if cash is required. Now, in some sectors, you may not be aware whether you are spending OpEx or CapEx. But what you do know is you're paying a supplier for goods or services in the form of cash. So cash are the funds you use to pay for these goods and services. On premise, this cash flow is spiky because of the unpredictable hardware purchases and annual licenses. You can't always predict when your service is going to break down and need to be replaced. In public cloud, it's much steadier. There's a pay monthly based on consumption model. Let's have a look at an example. So this will be an example profit and loss accounts. I appreciate in some sectors, this isn't represented as a profit and loss account, but for completeness, we will include income. So a profit and loss account starts with income and then it takes into account the expenditure items. So here we have IT costs as one of the items of expenditure. In this example, we're seeing the IT costs increase because in public cloud, as we mentioned earlier, there's a shift from CapEx to OpEx. In this example, other costs are remaining static, which gives you total OpEx, so total operating expenses, increasing, which is because the IT costs have increased. Now, when looking at profit and loss accounts, you have your net income, you take away your OpEx, and that gives you a profit or loss. In this example, we're calling that EBITDA, which is the general accounting term. This is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortisation. So you will see this has gone down because the IT costs have gone up. Now, remember, this was before depreciation. And we said earlier there's a shift from CapEx to OpEx. So when you include depreciation, here, for simplicity, we've got depreciation going down by the same amount that we saw IT costs going up. So after including depreciation, you get EBIT, which is earnings before interest in tax. And you'll notice this is exactly the same in both models. So what we've seen is the shift from CapEx, which causes depreciation over the life of the project, the assets, and an increase in IT costs. So EBITDA, EBIT, does it really matter? Well, in some industries and locations it does. In North America, it is very significant, as it is in many PLCs. So why is this? The analysts and investors use EBITDA to measure trading performance. Because depreciation is outside of this measure, and depreciation doesn't really measure trading activity, EBITDA is the main focus when looking at trading profitability. So things like bonuses may be on EBITDA growth or EBITDA as a percentage of income. And so it does get a lot of focus. And what we don't want is people adjusting the costs to negate the increasing IT costs, or we don't want inappropriate procurement behavior to try to manipulate these figures. What we need is for everybody to understand this bigger picture and to understand the shift between capex to opex and the implications that has on depreciation and the profitability measures. And underlying cash is key. So now we're going to have a look at some accountancy myths. So we've heard things like reserved instances can be capitalised. That is a myth. Also, dedicated hosting can be capitalised. That is also a myth. Now, whilst in these instances you are signing up maybe for a longer period, you don't, and, you, know, you don't own the underlying infrastructure, so it cannot be capitalised. Another myth is that consultancy, project management, training costs, or relating to cloud migration can be capitalised. This is a myth. 
These costs are not attributable to acquiring or constructing an asset. Now, cloud will be capitalizable in the future. So will it be treated as capex? No, that is also another myth. Now, it is true that the accountancy bodies in the UK and the US are looking at the treatment of cloud accounting. And there's a new accounting standard coming in 2019, IFRS 16, lease accounting. At the moment, there isn't any guidance on this that can be shared. So it's always best to speak to your accountants. So cloud is a lot less expensive or cloud is a lot more expensive. For this, we will look at TCO, which is a total cost of ownership model. So this model provides the solution with a higher value over time. It looks at how organisations can change the way they do business. So a TCO is often done for a three to five year time frame, but the benefits increase over time due to the learning curve for innovation and optimization. So what are the components? On-premise is the operational costs and the acquisition costs, the cost of buying it. In public cloud, the main cost drivers are storage and compute and data transfer. So some checklists, so include the cost of servers, storage, networking, IT costs, power and cooling, facilities costs. There's also some one-off costs. So you'll need to write off the netbook value of your redundant assets once your kit has been decommissioned. In public cloud, there's some optional extras, for example, whether to outsource to a managed services provider. The benefits of this is expertise in your market. They will provide an ecosystem of related products and services. They'll offer billing flexibility because they will provide your bill rather than the cloud provider. They'll be your main point of contact and keep you informed of the evolving technology. This means you can focus on your core activities. So we should always look at the value proposition. So the following areas should be included when presenting your value proposition of moving to cloud. It is about the business outcomes. And you will notice many of these are non-financial, enabling the organization to be better positioned to achieve its objectives. So platform breadth and global reach. Businesses no longer have to manage their own infrastructure. Instead, you can build sophisticated, scalable applications and have resources to run any workload from a platform that ex offers extensive services, features and geographical locations. You'll have superior reliability and high performance and sustainable and scalable IT. There's favourable economics, as we've just mentioned, and operational efficiency, so you can instantly scale up and down. This leads to improved agility and pace of innovation. So overall, this means that you can focus on your core activities rather than the infrastructure. And experimentation is easy to do at little cost. Really, the risk of not moving to cloud is the opportunity cost to the organization, resulting from a lack of speed and agility. So what does this mean for IT leaders? We need to communicate the strategy to explain the shift from CapEx to OpEx. We need to raise the understanding of the financial implications to ensure the right decisions are made. And we should always be led by what is best for the organisation and encourage closer working between finance and IT. Finance has to know IT and IT has to know finance. And that seems a good place to hand you over to Julian from IT. Thanks, Louise. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the potential financial benefits of the public cloud that can be initially overlooked. As an introduction, it's worth considering the different models of the uh, public cloud service. In particular, who has management responsibility for the different tiers of the ICT stack in each of the different models? For on-premise infrastructure, your organization has responsibility for the full stack. Infrastructure as a service provides responsibility or moves responsibility for servers, storage, networking, and the virtualization solution to the platform provider. Infrastructure as a service is available with an additional managed operating system service through managed service providers, 
This will include patching, backup, AV, and other OS maintenance. Platform as a service additionally provides management of middleware and runtime. Um, as an example, uh, a database service where you're responsible only for the data and not the underlying database software. So someone providing the actual managed uh, SQL Server instance, for example. Finally, Software as a Service provides you with a fully functional and managed application that is ready for use by your organization, and you have no involvement in the management of that application at all. When it comes to evaluating the financial benefits of moving to the cloud, the initial focus tends to be on the cost of running servers in the cloud versus running them in on-premise data centers. This excludes the benefits of transforming your IT by making use of multi-tenant cloud solutions. So, services, not servers. When server virtualization became the established approach within data centers, functions that were once installed on a single server tended to be split out into multiple servers due to the ease of deploying additional virtual machines. While this was a step forward in resilience and configuration management, it brought with it the need to manage many additional servers and copies of operating systems. The move to the cloud can reverse this trend through the use of multi-tenant services, where the platform provider looks after all the underlying infrastructure, including the operating system and core applications. For example, where you currently may have a Windows web server farm hosting a range of web-based applications, you could elect to deploy your code to a web application service with no requirement for you to manage the web server, operating system, patching, backup, antivirus, etc. What is more, the server farm could be scaled out and in automatically without any additional overhead for your team. The use of containers, for example, Docker technology, is another way to add agility to your applications, improve compute resource efficiency, and reduce the overhead of server management. This approach has been taken a step further with serverless technology that allows you to simply submit code to be executed and pay only for the compute time that it takes. It can be hard to quantify the financial benefits of the move to such platform as a service model, as the level of transformation of applications into this model that is possible can be difficult to determine. This should be part of an initial analysis of the candidate applications for moving to the cloud. Ultimately, it will be a key element of refocusing your ICT team on projects that differentiate your organization. In addition to transforming applications, there are a range of benefits within infrastructure as a service cloud platforms that are realized by changing behaviors related to server infrastructure. With an on-premise data center, compute resources are bought and paid for regardless of their level of utilization. Therefore, certain behaviors have no benefit. For example, reducing the source resources provided to a virtual server that is over-provisioned won't reduce costs, nor will powering off servers when not in use. In the public cloud, pay for what you use model, both of these can deliver significant savings. Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. is only 30% 30 30 of the hours in a week. So significant savings can be made by powering down unused infrastructure outside of the core hours. Scaling applications to meet increased demand requires the upfront purchase of computer hardware to cope with peaks, even though it may be hardly used to its fullest capacity. This can be a significant cost burden for data centers running spiky workloads. In the public cloud, you will pay more when you use more, but only when you use it. Public cloud IaaS also provides a great jump off point for further evolution of your ICT service. As you make more use of past services, for example, your databases, your IaaS costs will reduce in the public cloud. In the on-premise data center, little saving is achieved until the next infrastructure buying cycle meaning there is a period of paying double for the migrated service. The same applies to applications migrated to or being replaced by software as a service. Collectively, these examples show how the calculation of the cost of running your current infrastructure in the public cloud is only really an initial estimate and will not demonstrate the potential savings delivered by the cloud provider's massive economy of scale. I'm just gonna hand you back to Louise for a summary. Thank you. So the key messages are Public cloud is becoming the norm. This does mean a move from the CapEx to OpEx models. And the EBIT, EBITDA impact around the profitability measures needs to be understood. TCO model is great for looking at the longer term value proposition. 
always look at the bigger picture and understanding how to get the best value from public cloud. Are there any questions? Oh, I see um, we've got a question here from Dan around, is it best to do a big bang migration or move with agile smaller projects? Yes, um, so it depends on uh, what your, your key driver is for, for your uh, cloud migration. So if you have a, a compelling event that means you need to um, exit a data center in order to close down a building um, or some other uh, major uh, change, uh, that means that you need to basically find somewhere new to host your your uh, soft, your uh, applications. Then it is possible to do a big bang migration to the cloud. Um, the the uh, the approach will more or less replicate your your existing infrastructure in the cloud, um, and that's the fastest way to to deliver really. Um, if you have more time to think about it, then. Um, a, a migration over a longer period of time on a case-by-case -case basis um, with some transformation of your applications as you go. Uh, that's that's a sensible way to approach that. Um, so it's really a, a horses for courses depending on what your, your key drivers are. Okay, so we've got a, another question. Um, so as a finance professional, how do you sort of skill up and, and understand more about the cloud? Oh, that's a good question. So from business partnering with the IT professionals, you can gain a lot of knowledge. Also, the public cloud providers do also offer training. So there's a lot of training online. So I can recommend some of those if anyone would like to get in touch after the webinar. OK, well, I think we're, we're almost coming to a, to a close now. So thank you very much to, um, to Louise and Julian. Um, and uh, we just to let you know there's going to be more coming uh, for finance professionals um, and also for IT professionals wishing to understand more about how finance can play a role um, in digital transformation and adopting the cloud. Um, I think oh, actually we've got one more question coming. So when purchasing SaaS, what are the key factors to look out for, i.e. pitfalls? Um, so, I mean, is that something? Um, so uh, I'll take that one. So um, obviously the, the most important thing when, when uh, buying a, a SaaS application is that it meets your, your requirements. So having a good, solid understanding of what you need um, is, is uh, you know, paramount really to, to finding the right product. Um, what... Uh, uh, you know, typically um, SaaS applications are very good at the moment for for standard uh, business operations. So, um, you know, majority of organisations, eighty percent of what they do with IT is is pretty much the same as the eighty percent that that uh, other organisations do. And there's a, a small, maybe twenty percent of IT that's actually specialist um, that differentiates their organisation. So where you have a common uh, requirements across different organizations um, it's you know SaaS applications work really well because um, they're, they're designed uh, to deliver for everyone um, one of the things i would say in terms of um, SaaS that's, that's good to look for is um, something called the api um, so it might be getting a bit technical but um, essentially, with applications that you have in your data center today, you have access to the backend database, um, and it's common for people to run queries against that database and generally create uh, mini applications for uh, to support business services. And it tends to be a bit ad hoc, um, but there's a, a general um, expectation that you can get hold of that that data through that backdoor route. Um, with a SaaS application, that's not possible, not accessing um, the, the database directly, at least. Um, so that functionality is generally replaced by an API, which allows you to write your own applications to, to deal with data that you might have in that application. Um, so really good SaaS applications have a really good API. It's well documented. Um, it's secure and it provides all the functionality that you need. Um, Less good APIs, uh, not well documented, uh, don't work very well, um, and uh, may not actually cover all the all the uh, features that you need. So, in your um, in your initial uh, assessment of your requirements, it's worth thinking about what your future needs will be in terms of creating 
uh, applications that talk to this SaaS service um, and making sure that the API that that um, organization provides is fit for purpose. Um, it might be something that they still have on a roadmap um, and you'll be able to make a judgment as to whether you think they're going to deliver a, a, um, an appropriate API in the long term. Uh, but those are things that I would look out for. Okay. Oh. Okay. So we, we just we just gave a few more comments coming through. Mostly um, thank yous, which is lovely. So thanks very much for joining us today. And this will be this recording will be made available, um, and we'll be following up um, with all of the participants to share that with them. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>